fully cooly. What else is there to say about this series? It's wacky, zany, eccentric, in your face, loud, and doesn't let you get off the wild ride it has you on. It is the most out there concept for a coming of age story you'll find. A series with a message so deeply hidden it takes 25 video essays for you to completely understand it because that first viewing will leave you wondering what the hell even happened. So originally this video was going to be about me talking about Fully Cooly Grunge and Shoegaze but I figured nah that's way too simple. So because I'm me and I had to be extra, I spent the better part of two weeks rewatching every Fully Cooly season. Original, Progressive, Alternative, Grunge, and Shoegaze. I actually watched Grunge and Shoegaze as it was airing on Adult Swim. I was using that ancient tech known as cable to watch it. Yeah, I might be one of three and a half people to still use it, but I'm an old fashioned guy, what can I say? Something about watching Fooly Cooly on TV with commercial breaks feels right. Like how it used to be back when the original aired. But in this video, I essentially want to go over every single season and pretty much talk about them. Fooly Cooly has had this extremely cult following over the past 20 years now. Not a lot of people know of this series, but the ones that do, we go hard for it. So to see it evolve over time has been an experience to say the least. Especially seeing as I was a kid when it first came out and now I'm an adult. Fitting for a coming of age series, huh? Needless to say, however, but uh, this video is going to be a long one, ladies and gentlemen. So grab some snacks, grab a drink, sit down, and join your boy as we walk through all of Fooly Cooly. This series means a lot to me and I wanted to give it the time it deserves. So without further delay, let's head right into... Fooly Cooly was an OVA, or original video animation for those that don't know, that came out in Japan in April 26, 2000, but would get picked up and debuted in the West on August 4, 2003. Man, that was 20 years ago, holy sh- Fooly Cooly stars 12 year old man's man Nauda in his pursuit of adulthood. Now original Fooly Cooly had a lot of strengths, but a big one is with our main character. He's this 12 year old kid that has assumed this responsibility of being an adult, often shunning things that are kid oriented because he doesn't want to be seen as that. And this is already a very interesting characteristic. For anyone watching Fooly Cooly, we know this is a coming of age story and we're dealing with a kid who wants to grow up or believes he has grown up. Where have you seen this before? Any person at any time of their life growing up has wanted this before. You see adults before you and they're able to do whatever they want, say whatever they want, drink, smoke, you name it. Being an adult means you can afford all of these luxuries a kid otherwise won't have. So Nauda disregards being a 12 year old for wanting to be an adult. And over the span of the six episodes is watching this boy unravel and we notice what's really close to him, what he actually values and how contradictory the character can be. And not contradictory as in a writing flaw, but contradictory for the character's sense of what he believes adults should be. In comes Haruko, the poster child for this entire series, the 19 year old girl with the girl next door vibe going on for her. She has a very peculiar relationship with Nauda to say the least. Haruko is a wild character. She brings the zaniness of this series to the forefront. A lot of the gags and comedy roll off of her. She's what brings together the entire ensemble that is Fooly Cooly. Hendrix and McCarthy both start out like this. Yeah! Yeah! Haruko, hey! Fooly Cooly has a strong sense of comedic timing with its slapstick, already playing around with the medium that it's in. It's funny because Kazuya Suramaki, the director of Fooly Cooly, sought to break the rules of anime, and he very much succeeded. It felt more like a western cartoon than traditional Japanese anime. The comedy is also a thing for that, for its very snappy nature. It gives you enough time to breathe and then pulls you right back in with another gag, and the gags can vary with the same context surrounding it too. Fooly Cooly is very reliant on references, and that is prevalent throughout the entire show. Some are definitely going to fly over your head, and others you're definitely going to get. And it's not done where if you miss out on a bunch, the show itself tanks for you because it still has other moving parts working with it for it to still be an enjoyable time. Like there's references to MTV, Tom and Jerry, Van Halen, South Park, Jimi Hendrix, the list goes on and on. But back to our main character, Nauda. Out of all the protagonists shown in Fully Cooly, Nauda is easily the strongest in his writing. I mentioned before that he has his aversion to anything that could be deemed childish. This is present in every episode of the first season. Even going to episode 2, Firestarter, where the premise of the episode is that Mamimi is playing a handheld game called Firestarter, where you play as an arsonist trying to please the Lord of Black Flames. Nauda sees Mamimi playing this game and he simply goes, What's she on about? Oh, it's some video game. In high school, I guess they have a lot of free time. He not only sees the game to be childish, but the fact that Mamimi has all this time on deck to waste playing it. A game that Nauda should be playing because it would appeal to kids at his age, but he sees himself as above that because he's an adult in his mind. Mamimi is doing things that don't matter. Which is interesting in how this correlates to his relationship with Haruko. He ends up having feelings for a considerably older woman. 
omen that flat out tells him that she's the physical manifestation of his adolescent heart. It doesn't get any more explicit than that, honestly. But when you watch them interact with one another, it shows you who the child and the adult really is. And the adult surely is a Nauta. Nauta as a character is actually really passive. He has an inability to take charge of his life when it really matters, and no better episode that explores this is episode 4 Full Swing. This entire episode is a metaphor for Nauta. Even though Nauta portrays himself as someone that's capable, everyone that knows him knows that he can't follow through when it actually matters. The entire episode characters are telling him that he can't swing the bat. Haruko tells Nauta that nothing can happen unless he swings the bat. The whole episode is this getting repeated to him over and over and over again. In this very episode, we learn more about Nauta's brother, who at this point is a legend in the story, and Nauta essentially lives in his shadow, a very dependable and capable person that pulls through. Everyone else views Nada as exactly what he is, and he's the only person that doesn't view himself that way. A little boy to me, I'll kiss you on your forehead. Full Swing is a fantastic episode because it shows you one of many conflicts that Nada has. For a standoffish character that shuns a lot of things that he should be interacting with as a person, he can't do certain adult things that are expected of adults. There's this huge bomb in the shape of a baseball that comes crashing down on their town, and Nada is standing there attempting to take the swing, but he tenses up and he's extremely nervous. Even says that it's impossible for him to do anything and calls out for Haruka. God, if you listen, hey! Camera pans back and forth of imminent doom and now does unsure attitude towards it. Haruko tells us directly that maybe when the chips are down, he's too scared to swing the bat himself. Until he actually swings the bat. He fought against the fear and actually did it. Haruko joins in and helps him, but the fact remains that he was able to do it. For the first time in his life, he took charge of it and showed everyone that he could do it even when everyone doubted him. Aren't you embarrassed to act like that? The beauty of Fooly Cooly is not just our main character, but the characters within the story. The central theme of Fooly Cooly is not just a coming of age story, but the theme of adulthood. Nauda isn't the only character dealing with this. Nino Mori is Nauda's classmate. Her dad is being accused of having a mistress as he's married to Nino Mori's mom. But Nino Mori doesn't pay this any mind and is more concerned with the school play. Nauda's dad, Kamon, invites her over to their house for dinner, and when asked about anything regarding what's going on in her life, she goes, I don't think it's any big deal. Her shutting any other emotion down to just be driven by one set goal in mind, which is to do the play with Nauda. The people around her view her as very mature for her age to behave the way that she is. She's putting up a very convincing mask. Until we find out later on that she ended up rigging the vote so that she could be in the lead role with Nauda, taking great pleasure in how crafty she was in doing something like that because it's something you'd least expect. Of course, Nauda is still averse to playing the cat because he finds it stupid. Both Nauda and Nino Mori are handling the same thing differently. One shows a clear disdain for anything that can be seen as childish, meanwhile the other has an indifference to most things that people would otherwise acknowledge because it would affect them enough but it does actually affect her. We go forward a bit to when Nauda and Nino Mori are in school. Nauda is still not budging about how he feels about being in the school play, but Nino Mori insists on him partaking in the play, saying that a lot of people are going to see it and Nauda replies that only a few people are. To which we hear Nina Mori say that her parents are going to see the play together. These characters in Fooly Cooly all have things that they hold dear to them but won't expound on it due to how they perceive themselves. If they dwell on it, it might be seen as immature, so they focus on the next thing. Speaking of dwelling on the next thing, we have... Mamimi. Mamimi, man. This girl is a hot mess. She belongs to the streets. Mamimi is a girl who likes our boy Nauda, but liked his older brother initially because he saved her from her school being set on fire. That she caused. So because he saved her, she believed the two of them to be dating, and then broke up with him even though they were never together. Then I mentioned she set her school on fire. Mamimi is a peculiar one because she has this overtly childish nature about her even though she's considerably older than Nauda and Nina Mori. She treats Nauda as just a plaything always jumping onto him whenever she gets the chance and just has this overall sense that she's an idiot. Her relationship to Nauda is different from all the others. She's always an interest in him, but he's not exactly interested in her, and he finds her really annoying. Over time, he does come to like her, but when he tries to reciprocate her feelings, she rejects them. When Nauda becomes his own person, he tells off Mimi and says that he has an actual name, to acknowledge him and not his brother, because he's the one who's currently there. She becomes disinterested in him. That little boy she wanted to have wrapped around her finger is displaying independence and she doesn't want that. And it's wild because she ends up spiraling due to it. None of these characters know how to deal with their emotions and it's really beautiful to see how it varies from character to character. Nauda over the span of these 6 episodes goes through very drastic changes to his character. Episode 5, Brittle Bullet, is the best example of this. He's having a play shootout with his dad and this is something Nauda of episode 1 wouldn't care to do. But because it's over Haruko, he now has a reason to do it. Kitsurabami says the duel Nauda is having with his dad is stupid. Something that Nauda claims a lot of things are that people do. 
Even his friends realize what he's doing is extremely childish, but he has fun going through with it anyway. He's coming to grips on his actual feelings and attempting to correct the wrongs he believes he needs to fix. Even down to the adults in this season, Amaral constantly questions Nada's actions. When he meets him initially, he picks up on how Nada feels about Haruka and warns him to not get too attached to her because she's a menace, and that he'll see in due time. Or in the finale, he notices Nada drinking black coffee and asks him if he's drinking it because it makes him feel like a grown-up, always poking and prodding at Nada due to him feeling like Nada is just pretending to be a grown-up for the sake of it. It all comes together because every character's view of adulthood is challenged throughout the season and they each come to their own conclusions on it as the series progresses, not a waste moment between any of them. It takes an idiot to do cool things, that's why it's cool. Fully Cooly above all else feels like a celebration of the times. It's this great blend of animation and with an iconic soundtrack made by The Pillows, it makes itself known that it will stick with you forever just from how different it is. It doesn't feel like a traditional anime in the slightest because it doesn't even follow traditional story beats. I said it before, but on first views you can watch Fully Cooly, absolutely love the show, and not retain a single thing from it or know why you love it. And that's by design. The entire show is made with the intention of you not comprehending it. The show hits you in the face with striking visuals and gags that you don't know what to do with yourself. It understands itself and what it wants to do. It wants to give you an experience. It has a story underneath the wacky shenanigans on the forefront, but it's done in a very unconventional way, which is why the series is as beloved as it is. As I was rewatching Fully Cooly for the video and taking down my notes, at no point did it feel like a chore to do. Even though I was technically watching it for work, there's a lot of things you won't pick up on the first, second, third, fourth, twentieth viewing of the show, and it ranges from very minuscule things to outright blatant foreshadowing that pulls everything together now that you know the full picture. It's made with the notion of, you'll eventually be return to it, and seeing as Fully Cooly is a coming of age show, that was bound to happen anyway. I've watched Fully Cooly in different stages of my life, as a kid when it used to be on Adult Swim, as a teenager, and then as an adult. Ooh. Fun little story, but Toonami actually ran all six episodes earlier this year on TV, and of course, your boy was definitely in there watching that on a Saturday night. Yes, sir! It has these multi-layered characters set in this town that feels like it's being lived in. It tackles very mature themes of what it means to actually be an adult or how to handle your emotions. It also helps that the show isn't long either. It's only six episodes, which you can get through in one sitting. And those episodes go by so fast, you wonder where the time went. It's truly an amazing show. What's with the eyebrows, lover boy? An attempt at bushy masculine charm? For any of you born in the 90s to late 90s, you know we had this wonderful thing called Toonami, which was on Cartoon Network. The best channel for cartoons which can't be debated. But Toonami was a program that would used to run during the afternoon and on the weekdays that would show anime and more action-oriented American cartoons. But to predate that, Fully Cooly aired on Adult Swim's action block. Which is not a thing anymore, by the way, due to Toonami making a return in 2012. Let's go! That was our main way of watching Fully Cooly at the time. And for anyone that was growing up with Adult Swim, they definitely seen Fully Cooly. It wasn't the biggest anime in the world, but it's one of those things that you can mention to other people and they definitely heard of it or I've seen it before. It just felt like one of those wacky shows you see, but it has its place there. Fully Cooly ended up finally airing on the Toonami block on October 26, 2013 to January 25, 2014. Old 10 years later, so it got the people growing up with it to watch it as they got older, and they got newer viewers who never heard of the series until then managed to watch it too. Fully Cooley's soundtrack especially helps with it being as recognized as it is today due to it firmly capturing nostalgia. Seeing as Fully Cooley isn't a traditional anime, it doesn't follow the music you would typically see in an anime, especially at that time. To have an alt-rock band do your soundtrack, which then had them get a surge in popularity with the western audience because the music has that western feel to it. Of course, I being the child that I was and I viewed anime as just western cartoons, it very much has the feel of a cartoon. Not with the structure of a show like Panty and Stocking that more followed the western cartoon formula, but the fact that Fooly Cooly just felt like it was about nonsense and had fun with that. Cartoons always had a great time dealing with the nonsensical nature of what's happening within them and Fooly Cooly was no different. Fooly Cooly was a low-key anime for a lot of people, and whenever you see it in people's top 5 animes of all time, you can appreciate it because it's not something that gets brought up all the time, so when it does, it makes it feel special because you know this person has been around these anime streets long enough to put some respect on such a show. Fooly Cooly over time amasses larger following than it did back when it aired in the early 2000s. People making video essays on it now, character analysis videos, full on breakdowns of the plot and explaining all the character arcs, and then there's me cause you know, I gotta add something to the discourse too. It's a series that has a legacy behind it, and it's something so ingrained in Adult Swim I can't imagine Adult Swim not having it. I'm sure there are people that drew musical inspiration from the soundtrack as well. Hell, Fully Cooly served as inspiration to a little known series called Chainsaw Man. And Chainsaw Man is one of the biggest IPs to come out of anime and manga in recent years. If that doesn't show you how much Fully Cooly did for the landscape, then I don't know what else will. But now we're going to take a look at the other seasons of Fully Cooly. 
after many years of it being dormant and managed to return. And a return with the name... Fully Cooly Progressive this time being produced by Production IG. Production IG helped with the production of the original Fully Cooly, but that was done by Studio Gainax. Fully Cooly Progressive in the second season to Fully Cooly. Premiering on June 2nd, 2018 to August 18th, 2018. A whole 18 years after the first season and 15 years after the Western release. I'm sure no one saw Fully Cooly coming back with new seasons on their bingo card in 2018, but here we are. Fully Cooly Progressive stars main character and resident sad girl Hidomi. She wants nothing out of her life. No dreams, no aspirations, no goals, no future. Zero purpose. She's just existing with her e-girl headphones she's got going on so she can play Valorant with the boys. Hidomi is in a single parent household with only her mom, Hine, who runs a coffee shop. The two of them have a very distant relationship. Well, the distance being put between them is one-sided. It's mainly Hidomi that's putting her walls around Hine, and Hine tries her very best to interact with Hidomi and tells her how much she loves her. Hine has to legit threaten Hidomi to get a good morning out of her. Her mom has to understand that carrying the team during those late nights will have anyone feeling that way. In comes our dude Arag and his co Ide, who is a regular high school kid, but he actually has a part time job doing what is essentially slave labor. Man is being whipped and all to make ends meet so he can support himself due to him living in a very low income part of town. He keeps this a secret from everyone that aren't his close friends, being Goro and Marco. Ide has feelings for his teacher that he tries to win over. Unbeknownst to him, though, his teacher is actually Haruko in disguise. Haruko, this time sporting orange hair over her pink hair from season 1, is a teacher trying to get her students to activate their NO powers. She shows them porn in the first episode as a result of this. I'm not joking either. She had X videos open on tab 24, ready to show everyone the sauce. But there's a reason for her look being so different. Haruko has a second half known as Julia Jinyu. She meets with Hidomi and becomes a protector for the rest of the season. And very much akin to Haruko in season 1, asserting herself as the housekeeper for the Nandaba household. Although in this season, we find out that Haruko was indeed successful in absorbing Adamus, but with that, the two of them managed to split. Julia wanted to protect Adamus because she genuinely cares about him, while Haruko just wants the power for herself. With all of that being said, how is Progressive actually? Well, for starters, it's... Progressive is the exact opposite of what Fooly Cooly is supposed to be. What serves as a coming of age story isn't exactly realized with the writing of Progressive. There's no layer of nuance to this story, it just feels like shenanigans that has to tie back to Adamus. Hidomi's story is such a missed opportunity. She's a high schooler in a single parent household with her mom also trying to hold on for the sake of Hidomi and her dad that they're waiting on. This could have been the chance to tell a story about a mother fumbling around trying to be what a mother is supposed to be in her eyes but not getting it right due to the lack of a father being there alongside her. And a story about Hidomi struggling with all of that and shutting people out because of this. We do get the shutting people out part, but expound more on that. Whenever Naoda had issues with anything, the story took time to delve deeper into why it is he dislikes something. It made you peer more into the character to understand how he works. With the Domi, we just noticed she's affected by her dad being gone and that's it. We have the cause and the effect but nothing in the middle to tie it both together. There's a story to be told with not just Hidomi but with the mom. Fully Cooly Season 1 told multiple stories of several different characters regardless of age that were all interesting. Whereas in Progressive, a lot of things happen and it doesn't feel like it matters, which I'll talk about later. I don't understand how you have a story about a high school girl dealing with adolescence, maturity, and a single parent household and they do nothing with any of these things. There are parts in Progressive where they mention that they do care about the dad but it's just sprinkled in episodes and that's the most attention they put on it. They wanted to make it feel like it has this overall importance but they didn't give it enough time for it to breathe for us to believe that it's actually important. Especially seeing as you're dealing with a character that's a bit older than Nauda, we could have seen how not having a dad affects Adomi in her day to day life. What does she do that indicates that she's longing for a father figure? Is she doing things that shows us she's resenting the fact that he's gone? Is there any form of hatred or anger at the mom as to why the dad is not there? They don't even ask where the dad ran off to. He's just gone and left the cafe and a plan for Hidomi's mom and that's it. We could have seen how turbulent the relationship between Hidomi and her mother could have been during this scenario. Even in season 1 of Fully Cooly, we got some tension and ultimately conflict and resolution with Nauda and his dad but there's nothing here. We even had Nauda acknowledging his brother's absence casting this shadow over him and how he's perceived in Mimi's eyes to the point where he directly calls him out and says that he's actually the one that's still there. Hidomi's mom is extremely cheerful which could have been a mask to show us how she's struggling to keep it together raising a child by herself. A child mind you that doesn't care to say good morning to her and has to be forced to. There's just way too many opportunities for none of them to be realized like this. Also, Haruko doesn't play that much of an important role in any of this. She's just here to move actions forward but doesn't feel like she has a presence that's needed here. This could have been a beautiful attempt to show that Haruko and Hidomi are both longing for something more. 
Even though Hidomi shows us that she doesn't have any wants or needs, you can have a contrast with Haruko that does have wants and needs. It could have been a clash of ideologies and could have made for an interesting dynamic between the two. Haruko has such a great relationship with Naoda that helps shape his character and that's not done here with Hidomi at all. They barely interact with each other and when they do it's over nothing really, up until the last episode. At the very end, Haruko has a discussion with Hidomi over how a child begs and pleads for things and that's not how the world works. I'll give it back please, because it's all about what I want. I want everything to be mine. Give it to me more. You're like a child throwing a tantrum. You think you get things by asking? That if you're stomping, crying on the floor, people will just drop things in your life. Even though Haruko is also begging and pleading for Adamus to accept her, this story really could have coincided with the two of them. You could show us that even though Haruko prides herself on being an adult and is mature, she and her nature can be very childish when it comes down to the things that she has an emotional attachment to. <laughs> Why do you keep refusing to be mine? You are mine! I'm telling you, you're mine! You're mine! <sighs> Why would you look at me? Like I mentioned before, you can show how Haruko and Hidomi are both vying for attention from something that they can't achieve. Could have played into that to see how they're a lot more similar than what is on the surface. Ide is another case. He lives in a low income area and is literally doing slave labor to keep himself alive. This could have been a story about how he's trying to be seen as dependable and not useless. Seeing as he's also very young, there's a way to weave an adult in there. That you'll work a job that is awful, but you'll put up with it because it keeps you alive. It's also part of growing up that not everything you do and grind at is going to be enjoyable. Ide is also, you know, a horny teen. This is an opportunity to explore the line between intimacy and getting to know people as only a person of his age can. Original Fooly Cooly handled sexual attraction very well with how much Naoto was influenced and eventually fell in love with a much older woman in Haruko due to what she's shown him. How physically attractive she comes across to him and everyone. He wanted to be seen as mature so he's going after what he believes to be a mature woman. It's also interesting to note how progressive is animated. It looks cleaner and of course looks like a show that would come out at that time, but the art style is incredibly dull compared to the original. The OG did a lot more with its animation, whether it be changing up the styles for gags, being a lot more distinct and striking when it came down to certain episodes. It always felt like your eyes are being served to treat, whereas when you watch Progressive, it feels like you're watching a typical seasonal anime. Fooly Cooly's greatest strength is that it doesn't feel like a typical anime series. Even down to the fight scenes, the fight scenes lack any and all weight you could have had with them. Original Fully Cooly, you felt the weight behind every swing of that guitar when Kansi would fight, he moved very sluggish to show that throwing out an attack would take some time to deliver, mainly due to the Ava team being behind the production at the time of course. We're gonna touch on Ide's friends for a bit. Pause. Mori is wasted potential as well. We see him as a character that hops on fashion trends and wears a skirt as a male. He even claims that fashion has no gender. That could have been a story about him coming to terms with his masculinity and what it really means to him. He's envious of Ide getting female attention, but have him actually think about these things and wonder if it all means anything to him on his quest for being a man. He even hires Aiko to date him to keep up appearances that he's a regular guy, but that also could have been played with as well. Why does he go to these lengths? To impress who? And why? Aiko is another one. She runs this rental girlfriend service but then dislikes the actual activist so she gives people gifts in exchange so it doesn't seem like they're paying for her services. Her family doesn't seem broke enough to be pulling something like that off but it would have been cool to see why she's doing it. There's a little bit of something to give these characters a bit of depth to them for us to be more interested in them. Marco is just really passive. He doesn't have much character to speak of. He does develop this crush for Hidomi after she gets a personality change but that would have been nice to see. We got a semi love square in Oji Fooly Cooly with Naoto, Mamimi, Kamon, and Haruko. You could squeeze in Inamori in there as well if you really want to, but still. It would have been interesting to see a rift come apart between Marco and Ide over Hidomi, but that's just to give Marco something to do, honestly. All in all, Progressive is a massive heap of untapped potential, and it's a shame that so much was put into this season and nothing of it came to fruition. This season felt like it had so much to say, but when put in the spotlight to say anything, it doesn't take the opportunity to speak. It's frustrating because with everything in it, it could have been a phenomenal season, but it ended up going out on a whimper. I was supposed to make it! That's what happens in the movies! Having watched Progressive over again, a lot of things stuck out to me more than on the initial viewing ages ago. I explained it before, but there was a lot of things going for this season, or there would have been a lot going for it had they capitalized on the potential. Progressive is a lot easier to follow than the original Fooly Cooly, but it doesn't do anything grand. A story about dealing with an absent dad? That's ripe for storytelling, especially in a coming of age show. There's room for a lot of nuance with this sort of thing and if done well would have made a ton of people relate to a character like this. Progressive had a lot of good concepts put to paper but just comes across as an attempt to be fully cooly instead of being fully cooly. Even when it tries to be ridiculous and absurd the way the OG wanted it to be, it feels half-baked, just stripped away the fun and entertainment of it all. I know an argument will arise that says, you're just comparing it to the original, what if you separate it and treat it as its own thing? One. 
it's called Fully Cooly in the title, so that's going to be hard. It also has the OG band in it to capture the feel of the original. And two, let's say we do treat it as an original show, devoid of any part of Fully Cooly. This still doesn't excuse a lot of characters just not undergoing any arcs or having payoffs to their characters. There's still characters that meander and do nothing besides take up space. You still have a main character that has this great setup but gives us nothing to be invested in. Progressive feels like a second draft of a script that was chosen instead of the final. Also, shout out to Allegra Clark as the voice of Julia Ginyu. She was fantastic as her. Anytime she was on screen, it was always nice hearing her character say damn near anything. She made Julia sound a lot cooler than she looked, and she already had a cool look as it is. That's right, the real one's finally appearing. It's actually hilarious that Kazuya Suramaki, the original creator of Fully Cooly, initially didn't want to make another season because he felt like he did all he could with Fully Cooly. But after serious meetings, he got the motivation to return. But he specifically told the team, Look, what you guys need to do is find the next generation of young people who have their own thing to say, who maybe haven't even heard of Fooly Cooly. Or maybe they have, but they're not afraid of telling their own version of the story. We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled. The new creator took his advice and went, Oh, you mean just make it almost like Fooly Cooly? We got you. Let's just lazily replicate it as much as we need to because we just love the original Fooly Cooly. Progressive started out differently with a female protagonist, but we saw how that went. It wanted two things at the same time, but couldn't fulfill any of the needs. Wanting it to be an homage while also being a fresh take on the series becomes a lot more of the first than the latter. Them getting a lot of fresh blood to work on the series is something that stands out to me because it goes back to what always tends to happen when people that are fans of works work on things that they either make themselves or on things they grew up with. They don't know what direction to take them. Because it's so caught up on being fans of Fooly Cooly, they were more focused on that than fleshing out the story so that that lands before anything else. I don't think anyone asked for a continuation of Fooly Cooly. Everyone was more than fine with the OG. I sure as hell was. So when people found out it was coming back, they were shocked. Even more so when the quality wasn't up to snuff. But we're gonna close the chapter on Progressive. Next up, we got... Fooly Cooly Alternative is the third season of Fooly Cooly. It aired on September 8, 2018, a day before it was shown in theaters in Japan, and it ran until December 1st, 2018. Fun fact, the first episode dropped on midnight on April Fool's Day in Japanese subtitles as a joke in the US, but officially came out in English in September. Fooly Cooly Alternative stars 17-year-old Kana Komodo, also in high school, and she hangs out with her friends Hijiri, Pets, and Mosan. This season is set around these four girls and the lives they lead, this time focusing more on the characters than what we saw in the last season. Khan is a character that, much like Hidomi, doesn't have any aspirations or dreams, not a single goal in mind or anything that she wants to strive toward. She's content with keeping everything exactly as how it is. Mosan is a rather big girl. Rotund even. Fat as fuck. She looks after her weight but has a skewed way of perceiving it. She wants to be a fashion designer. Kijiri is the bombshell that gets attention and is idolized by everyone, especially Kana. She walks around with this aura of she's better than you and, and you know it! Chin up and everything. She's the person you keep your eyes on. Pets is someone that keeps her true self hidden from her friends, but on the surface, she's very chill and laid back. She has a knack for trading things and taking pictures. Alternative really sells you on these girls being the best of friends, to how familiar their dialogue is, to how close they feel to each other. Like the shot of them all sitting on the roof laying on each other is a good visual. It really displays how much of a tight knit group this all is that they can just lay on each other like that and talk about their lives. In a short amount of time, Alternative gets across that these friends are ride or die. They shit talk each other, but it's a friendly kind of shit talking. Nothing with any hint of maliciousness in it. It's a healthy friendship with its dips and downs in them, so it feels natural. Kana often monologues about the time she spent with her friends. She'd say that moments like these won't last and that you won't know what's truly important in your life until you lose it. Which is foreshadowing if anyone's ever seen his true gaze, but we'll get to that when it's time, but let's believe it. My life plan is to marry rich, like to a basketball player. Or better yet, to a famous rapper. I could totally picture myself doing that. Like Kardashian? Yeah, why not? It's always surprised me that Progressive didn't show nearly as much focus on its main cast, but then Alternative spends so much time on its main cast. It's night and day how they're both handled. It's more of a handle of the direction where it wanted to take each of their characters. Give them full on episodes of development and conflict that they all had to wrestle with. I mentioned before that Kadomi and Kana are very similar characters. Both of them have no dreams or aspirations and are content with that. Kadomi is a lot more passive about how things are, but Kana isn't. Kana, while fine with how things are, will do her best to maintain that to be the same, always making sure she gets to the bottom of her friends' problems. Two characters with the same core values, but one is treated with more depth, whereas Kadomi just left her own devices and nothing more was done with her. It felt like Kana was able to get closure on her character arc, whereas with Hidomi, there's still much left to tell, but we were never given that. Kana's character, even in comparison to her friends, doesn't have that much depth due to the fact that her friends all have aspirations and things that will take them on a journey. Kana doesn't have that. Characters like this will stagnate unless handled correctly. In Kana's case, she definitely did feel this way, but they managed to address it at the end. 
She's mainly in the back scene even though she's a main character, opting for the role of the helper to make sure her friends achieve the dreams set out for them whereas she's just chilling letting things be as they are. Whenever things get brought up about what her future might entail, it stresses her out, much like a kid at that age would usually respond with. There's something endearing about Kana that people can relate to, and it's wild because I'm sure Hidomi could have been the more relatable of the bunch seeing as she's only a mom, but hey. High school is supposed to serve as some of your best years before you're thrusted into the world of adulthood, so Kana wanting to hold on to that is a realistic want, just something to get invested in rather than having nothing to be engaged with. You won't know what's truly important in your life until you actually lose it. It was said that for Kazuya Suramaki and the team working on Fully Coolie that these new installments focus on women. As insightful as the original Fully Coolie is, it's unabashedly a story about reckoning with male sexuality. Progressive and alternative lend that same awkward insight to modern day preteen and teenage women. This concept is perfect. Fully Cooly being a coming of age series should be able to branch out to differing ages and people. Season 1 focused on a 12 year old boy in Nauda and we got to explore everything going on with him including the angst he was dealing with. So having the next 2 season star female protagonist can be great seeing as it's a different perspective and at differing ages as well. There's a lot that could be done with something like this and the amount of metaphors you can put into a series like these. It helps breathe new life into Fooly Cooly, shows that it has some range, that it's able to tell stories regardless of who's in the driver's seat, wanting to make it something equally relatable. With a coming of age story for women, it's able to tackle some interesting subject matter which Alternative did manage to touch on. Whether it be the strength of female friendships, the fear of aging, dating outside of your age range. I'm gonna get to you Hijiri, just you wait. Just like with Naoda in this chase of being an adult, there's a different way boys would achieve that over girls. Which leads me into Hijiri's character. She has a lot of what I mentioned before. As she's introduced, she's held to a higher standard than everyone else. Everyone labels her as the mature one. She carries herself as if she's an adult. Even tells Kana at several points that some things she's not going to understand due to her still being a kid. Nothing phases Hijiri because that'd be childish. With this, Hijiri finds all the boys in her school to be immature to deal with. They're not on the level she's at so she doesn't pay them any mind so she dates a college student. Something more her speed. Something mature. Oh! Maturity being the heaviest theme in all the Fooly Cooly is interesting to see how she's dealing with it. This is a very real thing that happens. I know for a fact that anyone that went to high school, there was a girl you knew or even a girl you had a crush on that was dating a much older man. Shit is sickening, I know. But that's a very uncomfortable topic to talk about and to handle that is something I'm sure a bunch of people would stray away from. But in Hijiri's pursuit of being an adult so fast, she gets caught up in this relationship. Now this man Toshio should know better but he's a big part of the problem. Episode 2 is aptly titled Grown Up Wannabe because that is exactly what Hijiri is. Hijiri is deflecting the entire episode. Even after Toshio breaks up with her, she still makes it seem like nothing bothers her even though it clearly does. This is a good look at how different these stories can be and what can be tackled. Funny how both season 1 of Fooly Cooly and 3 have characters pining after older people. Ain't that some shit. But on to healthier things, friendships in high school. Female friendships can be very tumultuous over a myriad of things, but it's great to shed some light on it. The really good times spent, the hardships during it, it all comes together to make what you're seeing on screen that much stronger. It reminds me of whenever you watch a sitcom and the two sisters or best friends are fighting the whole episode but when they both take accountability for their actions and make up, it's something great to witness and you can relate to that. So when Hijiri at the end of the episode realizes that she's been looking down on everyone and pretends to be something that she's not, she swears to never do it again. Girls do like to keep up appearances, especially in high school, gives them that ego boost. Even though Kana was butting into business that really wasn't hers, it shows the love that these girls have for each other, that sisterly bond that can't be shaken so easily. It's a series that knows it has enough to tackle anything it can because it has enough knowledge to do so. Storytelling like that goes a long way. There's a reason why the OG is so fondly thought of after all this time. High school girls can be so complicated. While Alternative still isn't better than Season 1, it's an enjoyable enough addition to the series. I commend the creative efforts behind it and what they wanted to portray with this season. It's the season that had its own identity rather than trying to be something it clearly wasn't. It's respectable. Even if it doesn't hit the same beats, it still made a valiant effort to give something different and to tell a story that they felt confident enough in telling. I remember the general consensus around Progressive and Alternative is that mostly everyone found Progressive to be straight buns, but Alternative was enjoyable. Not the greatest thing in the world, but still an enjoyable time. I'd agree. Even after all this time has passed, I still find Alternative to be enjoyable with the main characters being its main selling point. It tries to keep the soul of Fooly Cooly intact. It would've hit a bit harder if they went full on with the metaphors, but they went with more of a telling approach instead of showing it. It at least tries to build something with its side characters instead of just throwing them to the wayside like in the previous season. Looking back at Alternative with Shoegaze now being a thing, it puts things into a very somber light, which I'll get into later, but it actually builds it up over time. You can have you go back to it and then look at every episode in a different light now that you're seeing things in a different setting. But I'm gonna close the door on Alternative for now. We're jumping into modern day Fooly Cooly. Next up is... Mm. 
Fully Cooly Grunge is the fourth season of Fully Cooly. It ran from September 9th, 2023 to September 24th, 2023, with a total of three episodes. Fully Cooly Grunge this time takes place in a town called Okura, starring three main characters that all deal with Haruko on a single night, and each perspective intertwines with each other. Grunge is supposed to serve as a prequel to season one Fully Cooly, which is wild to think about. Shinpachi, age 15, is a boy that works in his dad's sushi shop. He's fresh out of high school due to his education being stopped after teachers agree to not teach anymore after the town is constantly being destroyed. He has dreams of hopefully leaving this town behind. He has constant references to what being a man is and what should be done as one. Shonari, age 15, and totally not Ben Grimm, grew up with his older brother Dainari after both of his parents died when he was just 10. Shonari used to get bullied in school for being an alien. The other kids would throw rocks at him until he had enough of that shit and threw one back. Which landed him in jail, naturally. His brother pleads with the police to release him because he's a kid, but due to his size, they mistook him for an adult and he was just kept there. After he gets let out, Dainari tells Shonari that he needs to get a proper education and a good job to leave the planet so he doesn't have to deal with the discrimination anymore. Shonari is best boy at the moment. He also has a crush on another main character. Lastly, we have Orinoko, also age 15. She scavenges around her local mountain in search of iron for her dad who happens to be a bladesmith. Her dad is also pretty sick and has shown that his skills aren't what they used to be, but this has no bearing on Shinpachi when he requests to play from Orinoko. And yeah, that's pretty much all the characters. Haruko is around. She plays a part in every episode being involved in one way or another. This is the first Fully Cooly installment that takes place on a single night, also the first season to have three episodes. Only be followed up by Shugei's and other three episodes, but it's quite the direction to take the series. Speaking of directions, we gotta talk about the- Yeah, I'm literally screaming right now! If there was a Guinness record for creepy, you would hold it! Man. This shit looks like ass. That shit stinks! I remember when the teaser trailer came out back in 2022 and it had this render, and I figured it was just for the teaser. Boy, was I wrong. So they wanted this completely CG 2.5D art style for grunge, and it does the series a complete disservice because it's so ugly to look at. Fully Cooley's charm is that it's so visually striking, so when you look at grunge, it's the complete opposite of that. The entire time I'm watching these episodes, I'm thinking to myself, it's like watching season one Ruby all over again, and that came out 10 years ago. Yes? I said, put your hands in the air, now! Man, that was 10 years ago. But grunge just looks off. The new art style makes all the characters move around so stiffly. Everything looks so restricted in it, and the people very much let them know that the art style was definitely not the move. CG and anime already has a stellar reputation in the anime community as it is. <laughs> so to see Fully Cooly with it and it looks this awful is not something I expected. It's easily the worst looking in all of the seasons. I will say though, there's an amazing shot of Orinoka looking at a rocket in the sky and there's a close-up of her face as she's crying. One of the best shots in the entire series, one of the only times the CG art style compliments this. I've seen worse art styles, but this still isn't great. It visually doesn't make the show an enjoyable watch, seeing as Fully Cooly pride itself on showing you insane visuals that are beautifully accompanied by the stellar animation. With the animation being so stiff and bogged down by this drastic change, you lose out on that magic because you can't get across that was once had. Orinoko's episode, I will say, is the only episode that tried to make the art style work to its benefit, and that's due to it having very pretty backgrounds to distract from the CG. But that entire episode was very artsy in how it was handled. That at least made it palatable. If the other two episodes work like this, then maybe you can give it a pass, but man, this just was not the play at all. Even the director of Grunge Takakiyo, who works for Studio Mont Blanc that specializes in CG anime, was very unsure on how they were going to pull off a full season of Fully Cooly in all CG. Granted, over time everyone felt confident in their skills with it. I respect that they did or try to make it work, but it just didn't. It's definitely a bold play to make though, and a departure from how the series was handled before, but they attempted something. And it was an attempt, alright. Study hard. Make money. Get the hell out of here, okay? Okay. This is a story about three main characters that all work, but the only person that comes out of this with any depth is Shonari, and that's the second episode. There's a lot of missed opportunities for storytelling here, and that was strange to me, seeing as this was one of the easiest ones to pull off. Shinpachi's story is of a boy fresh out of high school and he's working in the family business. This had the opportunity to be a cool story of what's expected of a boy after a certain stage of his life has been met. Yes, he had to forcefully leave school due to the circumstances of the town, but it can reflect on what he has to do as a man now that he's working. What does he personally want out of everything? The episode doesn't necessarily delve into these things, and he had the chance to, but it wasn't taken. It would have been nice to see him grappling with the concept of adulthood and what it entails. We up until this point haven't seen a character in Fully Cooly after high school, so that would have been a different spin on the coming of age tale, but they didn't go through with it. Yeah, he's 15, but at this point in his life he has to grow up faster than just be the average 15 year old. 
play into that. Does it take a toll on him? He wants to leave the town. He has to talk with his dad about stopping the corrupt mayor and said that it's his duty as a man to do something about that. Talk more about that. Don't just have it be there and then not follow through. Shonari's episode is a standout of the three. There's a clear end goal for his character as he's thrusted into a world of violence with an older brother. A kid dealing with bullying for being different while also being the little brother of a person in a prominent gang is an interesting story, showing us how a character like that doesn't need to be a product of their environment. His brother Dainari even wants this for him. I'd have liked to have seen more of this actually. Would have liked to see him as a main character overall and have more episodes surrounding it. Orinoka is a very artsy episode, but outside of that, there's hints of things going on beneath the surface. How she has some resentment towards a robot maid due to her dad being very loving toward it, which is already a lot more than what Hadomi was showing us. Had these characters been given a much better art style and more episodes and with better direction, this could have made for a much better season, but the three episode format for this kind of story is more to their detriment than a benefit. As okay as Shonari is, none of these main characters are memorable enough to hold enough weight. Again, that's mainly a part of them each having one episode apiece in a 3 episode season in a single night. It's just content for you to consume and to not think about it later on. Should have given it some time to breathe so these characters can be fully realized so we have something to be invested in. Now they're seeing a trend with these seasons in this regard. No, I didn't say it like that. As I look through videos of behind the scenes footage for these seasons, it's always fascinating to see how much everyone is a big fan of Fully Cooly and hopes to make it true to the series and to Suramaki's vision, but they just don't do that. Grunge was met with universal disdain when the trailer came out. It's not something anyone really asked for. I thought Fully Cool was pretty much done after Progressive and Alternative, so to see it back 5 years later was a huge surprise. The overall product seemed rushed, like it had to be made for the sake of pushing something out. It didn't feel like Fully Cooly. Haruko is here in every episode, but she's doing her own thing and interacts with the main characters briefly before she has to dip out. I miss when she had an overall effect on main characters. If Haruko is going to be your personal girl for the franchise, have her do more than just be there for some gags and that's all. But there's only so much that could have been done with only 3 episodes. The Pillows made their return, which is the most consistently great thing about Fully Cooly coming back. They have a lot more of their OG songs in this season. The Pillows are such an integral part of Fully Cooly, I can't imagine them not being a part of a season. It'd be like a cardinal sin if you didn't bring them along. No matter how buns the season could be, you can count on the Pillows to deliver some quality music. Grunge is a strange season. I watched it as it was airing on Toonami and rewatched it for this video. It felt more like a drag the second time around than the first. Mainly because I had that weak spread so I can refresh and come back to the next episode. Watching all three back to back was not the move, let me tell you. But at least it was over pretty quickly. Like Progressive, there was potential here but they didn't capitalize off of it. It's crazy to me that Fully Cooly as a whole with each season doesn't have bad concepts for seasons, and the ones they miss out on have the most potential to be a banger. The blueprint is there. You don't have to make a one-to-one -one, shot for shot remake of the original in modern times, but it's a shame that Fully Cooly is this thing that should be this wild show that takes risk every season, but delivers on nuanced subjects over what we get now. It's just a product. But to not dwell on grunge any longer, we're shutting this one down and moving on to the next season. The next season being <laughs> Fully Cooly Shoegaze is the fifth season of Fully Cooly. Ran from September 30th, 2023 to October 14th, 2023. It is the first ever season of Fully Cooly to serve as a direct sequel. Shoegaze is a direct sequel to Fully Cooly Alternative set 10 years after the events of that season. It's wild to think that we're five seasons deep and the only true sequel is the fifth one and it's for the third season. Fully Cooly Shoegaze stars two main characters and 15 year olds Masaki and Harumi. Masaki can see ghosts since he was five and every time he would tell people that he can see them, they all ignore him. He's essentially a loner. No friends to speak of, and at this point, he doesn't care to make any. He's very closed off from the world and hates it even. He just exists in it. He does draw sketches of the ghosts he sees, which attracts our girl Harumi to him. Harumi is... something. This is her first line of dialogue that I had to rewind in case your boy wasn't tripping. So, what should we do? <laughs> hey, wanna drink my pee? Uh, nasty bitch. Yeah, she's wilder. Oh, I forgot to mention, but we have our traditional 2D animation back. I won't lie, I was already hopeful the season would turn out better because at least I can look at this and not feel sick. The differences between Misaki and Harumi are night and day. Misaki is a lot more reserved and shuts himself off from everything. He's fed up with the world. Whereas Harumi is very in your face and says anything that comes to her mind, no matter how vulgar it can be. Shugaze really gets across the duality of these characters. Masaki and Harumi have barricaded themselves inside this building known as Sugane Tower. They do this to investigate the giant bird that sits atop the tower that only Masaki can see. And to counteract this, we have Kanda from Alternative and a return from none other than Kanda from Alternative. Now 27 on the scene to try and extract them. Kanda now works for the feds. Funny how life works out, huh? Also something major to point out, this is the first season to not star Haruko in any capacity. She has a brief mention in the last episode and not even by name. This is by far the boldest move that anyone has taken in any of these seasons. I thought for sure that Harumi would be a cover for Haruko, seeing as they sound very similar, but nope. An entirely different voice had to play as Harumi and there was no hidden disguise. That's a new character that is as eccentric as Haruko can be. Threw me for a damn loop. Turns out people who wear crazy clothes also say crazy things. 
I have to admit, I was more than pleasantly surprised with how enjoyable Shoegaze ended up being. Now that he managed to do a good amount with the three episodes they were given, but this easily could have benefited from more episodes, especially with how Khan's character is portrayed here. It actually feels like they wanted to be something different without trying to be a carbon copy of something that came before. So much so that even though they have the pillows back for this season as well, this season features entirely new music from the band. No returns from any prior songs from past seasons. No Little Busters, no Last Dinosaur. Last Dinosaur is a personal favorite for me, boy, but anyway. Not a single song returned, and I wasn't noticing that upon my initial viewing of the show. I figured at some point there was going to be a returning song, but nope. And the new music they did was great, but that's to be expected. A lot of interesting firsts for this season. Shoegaze has a good hold of the direction of its characters. There's something about the second season of Fully Cooly being overall decent, whereas the first is just bad. Don't know what's up with that, but regardless. The entirety of Shugei shows how attracted Masaki is to Harumi, which is a feeling very alien to him. Seeing as he hates the world and everyone in it, having someone being able to bring out that emotion like that to just outright care about someone else is doing a number on him. Harumi and Masaki's relationship is an amusing one, considering Harumi is telling a character that's very passive to just do whatever he wants to do. Harumi lives a life without having any regrets. The story honing in on that young, rebellious teenage fun is something that a lot of slice of life stories tend to tell, and that's cool to see being implemented in here. Even though the two of them are trespassing in this building, Masaki is driven to see this task be completed because he feels like there's something at the end for him. He's determined to actually do something. I like the fact that Harumi is directly influencing Masaki. She keeps trying to pull him into her world and to see things from her point of view. Feeling like the resident doomer on Reddit can only be so much fun, I'm sure. This season also does something that I wholeheartedly appreciate that it did. They put Kana in this story and they managed to make her a really, really good character. Even though it's focusing on the main characters here, there's also a focus on the previous main character of Alternative, Kana. It's something that I realistically didn't think I needed to see or care to see more of, but I'm very happy we got another look at her character because it did wonders for her overall. Which leads me into my next part. You're busy dealing with real grown-up problems here. When I saw the trailer for Shoegaze, I was floored and confused at the fact that Kana was returning. Out of all the Fully Cooly protagonists, the one they went to follow up on was Kana. I didn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was wondering what they were cooking with this because it's such a swerve to see. Everyone was caught off guard by that as well. Then to hear that it's straight up a sequel to Alternative, it's like, oh, they're really going in on this, huh? Kana and Alternative was just... okay. There wasn't a lot to say about her up until the end, and that was just all the build-up we had before, so she could have her moment. But Shugaze makes the most of this character, and it doesn't into her protagonist well into their adult years. The same years that Kana was dreading because of her uncertainty of where it would go. She's three years away from 30, so we have to see what she's been up to in the past. We go back seven years to a 20-year-old Kana who's talking with her friends in a group chat. And it's important to see that everyone has their updated profile pictures to reflect who they are now, but Kana's has stayed the same with her profile picture being the one she had from high school. Still with the notion of making sure she keeps everything the same. And seeing as it wasn't that long since they graduated, she definitely was hell bent on that aspect. She's dressed up for a coming of age ceremony, but neither Mosan nor Hijiri is able to attend. Episode 2, Generational Battle, serves as Kana's episode. In the span of these 10 years, Kanda gave Kana a job to work for them after the events of Alternative and he's trying to activate her NO powers. The same powers that don't activate anymore. She looks miserable here, just so out of it. She applied for a nursing job, to which Kanda rejects. Harumi gets on the line with Kana and she pretty much extorts women to get candy out of her. Kana, of course, has to follow through with the rules laid out before, before Harumi does some bullshit. She goes to the candy store and she spots two little girls looking through the candy and she sees herself and pets in that spot. We also see that her lock screen is a picture she took with Mosan and Hijri when she was 17. Kana throughout the episode wonders when did she become so miserable, it's not something that she used to be before. The exact opposite even, but there's a reason for this of course. Let it be known that it's very much implied that Mosan and Hijiri have skipped town leaving only Kana here. From how Alternative went, it looked like this was going to be the next step for the girls. Kana being content where she is, and Mosan and Hijiri being the ones with dreams set in stone, they were going to leave that town any chance they got. Kana even says that she has no idea where she's headed. Even after 10 years have passed, her life still doesn't have any direction. Kana eventually meets up with Harumi with a bag of candy in hand, and this is when we get a great scene from her. Harumi makes a lot of assumptions about Kana, and Kana outright tells her that it isn't fair that she's saying any of that due to her not even knowing who she is. And this is when we get to really see Kana for who she is, all the feelings she's been bottling up inside over time. Don't expect big things from me when I never asked for it! I wasn't prepared and they still dumped responsibilities on me! And then they abandoned me! Nothing made sense, but I shouted at the top of my lungs! I never knew if I fit in, but I kept going! Kana talks about the responsibility that was thrusted onto her when she never asked for any of it, how she has all these expectations put on her that she has to uphold. She brings up people abandoning her after they put said responsibilities on her and it cuts back to scenes of alternative with her friend. This is the culmination of Kana's character over the times. Her pent up anger and frustrations coming out 10 years later. She explains how the world she chose back then had days where they blended together and that she does have regrets but in spite of it all, she continues to live. 
This episode gave us a full picture of Kana and how she's a completely different character than how she was an alternative, while still being the same in certain aspects. Who was once a cheery, energetic character is now extremely bitter and angry at the world over how her life went, and the things she hoped to have kept close to her ended up leaving her. Her still continuing to live in spite of these things is very true to her speech at the end of Alternative. It's with this that I became 100% invested in this character now, something I didn't feel when watching Alternative. I wanted a reason to like Kana, and Alternative serving as part 1 to her story and Shugei's being part 2 has made me retroactively care about the character. Without Shugei's, I'd still not care for Kana, but with Shugei's existing, it's made me appreciate her character in Alternative for the simple fact of what was built off of her. They managed to pay it off in the end, and that's commendable. Kana wasn't prepared for adulthood and for things to change, but you fast forward and everything has changed for her. The biggest thing is that her friends are now gone. Kana's friends were her entire world, so to see those ripped away made it for an interesting character change that actually makes her more interesting. It hit her hard when Pets left, but after Hijiri and Mosan left, that sealed the deal. So for the next 10 years, she's been carrying this bitterness and anger around that she's never been able to express before, not until she meets Harumi. Shugase is pretty fascinating in the fact that it manages to tackle two different aspects of life, two high schoolers and someone in their late 20s. Kana served as what Harumi didn't want to see if that's what lies ahead of her being an adult. A lot of adults portrayed in Fully Coolie are rather miserable and don't have their faculties together. Kana falls into that miserable camp but not into the realm of hopelessness. Even though she's at rock bottom, she's going to keep on trudging on. A great callback to Alternative. At this juncture, people can definitely relate to Kana. You make some of the best friends you'll ever have in high school, hanging out, playing games, etc. And you're with these people for a considerable amount of years. You swear there's no way you can all stop being friends, but as soon as you all graduate, you never hear from them again. Kana and Alternative was driven to always be there for her friends to the point it pissed them off whenever she tried to butt into their situations. She essentially lived for her friends, and that's not there. If there's any hardship in her life, she has to thug it out by herself because the rest of her friends just aren't here. And Kana sees her friends in everything that she does. They spend so much time together that with that, everything ties back to them. I feel for that. Only thing is that I wish this also got more episodes to flesh this out because had this been given some time to cook, it would have been better than what we got. A story like this being relegated to only one episode is the biggest thing in this entire thing. That's the only problem I have with this. A lot of it had to be shown in very brief flashbacks, but I'm sure people would have been pretty receptive to this story being expounded upon. They did the most they could with this episode. I'm all for warming up to characters over time when they're given that development and Kana surely got that in Shugaze. Calls himself Adamus. Jason DeMarco, the senior vice president of the anime and action series department at Warner Brothers Animation, said on Twitter that Adult Swim considers Fully Cooly Grunge and Shugaze ratings successes and is very happy with the performance. The company won't be making any more. Now, all this means is that Fully Cooly won't be premiering Adult Swim or under their brand. Production IG can very well make other seasons of Fully Cooly for streaming services and the like, which I 1000% see happening. Nothing ever stays dead in this day and age, and I don't see Shugei's being the penultimate end of Fully Cooly. Especially seeing as this was a season that didn't show Haruko in any capacity. I don't know if Production IG wants to go out like that. I will say it would be extremely weird to see Fully Cooly associated with anything else that's not Adult Swim. It's a mainstay on that program, so to see it somewhere else would just feel off. I'm glad the team that Adult Swim are content with what they did with these seasons, enough for them to stop because I'm perfectly fine with Fully Cooly not continuing. All of us but our cable boxes pulled through and made them happy in the end. Like I said before, but watching Fully Cooly on Adult Swim every week complete with ad breaks just brought me back to when times were simpler and streaming wasn't even a concept, to how media was meant to be consumed. It was special, so if this is the end to that, then no matter what, your boy felt right at home watching it. So if it's goodbye to Fully Cooly and Adult Swim, then hey, we had some wild bumps on this ride, but it was a ride nevertheless. Let's get it on! Fully Cooly over the years to me has felt like something that just has that never say die attitude. It's something that comes back and I'm like, again? Really? Okay. It's always a shock because whenever Fully Cooly returns, it's always done years down the line to the point you forget about it. It always gets people. But if it were me and you had to have Fully Cooly return, that would be a thing where it comes back every five years or so. It gives enough time for culture to shift and for the times to change. I've always had in my mind that if Fully Cooly was done this way, it could always be a product of the times. Never ever feeling stale because it's always in the modern day regardless of when it comes out. I like that idea for it to just be a show that can take you back during certain eras. The series as a whole is nostalgic, so it can serve as something that's nostalgic for so many age groups. I know a thing I wanted to see personally is if Fully Cooly ever did return, I'd like it to center around Mamimi, for the simple fact that this is a severely damaged girl and she had a dream of becoming a photographer. I would have loved to see a progression towards that of just her behavior as an adult. Did she mature? Did she regress? I want to see what kind of stories are I play with something like that, and it can be a story that centers around an adult, it can have your callbacks to the original but still putting focus on her story being as great as it can be. This was a video I was meaning to make for a while, and I'm glad I finally got around to it and that I took it in this direction because now that I look at Fully Cooly overall in a different light, it made me see things I didn't see before in my other countless viewing. It's a series that means a lot to me as I listen to the soundtrack damn near every day. 
I even own all the vinyls for it so far, and it's easily the most played records on my record player. I'm eagerly waiting for when that Grunge and Suge's vinyls are able to be bought. I'm gonna be all over that. So to Fooly Cooly, I don't know where you're gonna go from here, I don't know what directions you'll take, if you even will take any more directions, but I'll be here for them if they do happen. And if they don't, then, well, we got more than enough content over these years. Fooly Cooly is a cult icon for a reason, his popularity has a place. I'm glad such an out there and wild story exists with these set of characters, and it's something you don't get to see every day. This video is already as long as it is, but what do you guys think? How did you get into Fooly Cooly? What seasons did you like the most? You can tell me all about it in the comments, and I'll be seeing you all next time.